Hi, this is Matthew Cratter from Trader University. And today I want to talk about whether the Dow can hit 100,000 fairly soon. Right now the Dow's trading at about 24,000. So to get to 100,000 would be really a tremendous move up. But I do think it's possible. Now, if you're interested in learning how to make money in the stock market, or you just want to see what I'm investing in these days, be sure to hit that subscribe button. So the way this would work would be this. The U.S. spends a certain amount of money. The U.S. federal government spends a certain amount of money and brings in a certain amount of money. So right now we're bringing in about three and a half trillion in federal tax revenue. This is obviously falling because of the uh, financial crisis. We're spending closer to six trillion. And the more, uh, the more crisis packages that, that Congress passes, the higher the spending is going to go. So what do you do when you are only bringing in 3.5 million and you're spending six or seven million? Well, like anyone else, the U.S. federal government has to borrow money. The way they borrow money is by selling treasuries. These are the debt securities of the United States. They sell these treasuries, they get cash, and then, wow, Congress has all this free money that it can, that it can spend. Now, the federal debt has grown quite a bit over the past 50 years. It was really in the, call it 300 billion level in, uh, in uh, the early 70s, now approaching 23 trillion. And if we look at it just in terms of how fast it's grown versus the economy, federal debt as a percentage of GDP, so GDP is one measurement of economic output. We used to be, uh, we used to be uh, closer to call it 30% debt divided by GDP. Now we're above 100%. Once countries get above 100%, very bad things happen. The good news though, is that the US dollar is still the world reserve currency. And the way the deal has sort of sort of gone for the past uh, 20 years has been this. The US made this agreement, basically the, the, the Ch uh, China was brought into the WTO, I believe in 2000, 2001. And this, the, the current system was set up then. So the basic deal was the US would export all of its manufacturing jobs and factories to China, the vast majority of them. China would be able to, because it has lower labor costs, would be able to make all this uh, stuff uh, for much more cheaply than, uh, the, than U.S. manufacturers could. And so they would sell this stuff to the United States, goods and services, but mostly, mostly goods. What happens when they sell us stuff? Well, we pay China in U.S. dollars. And then the agreement was a sort of tacit agreement. China would take those U.S. dollars and buy U.S. treasuries with it. So they would basically reinvest their earnings back in uh, to the U.S. economy by buying government debt. Now, what was the advantage of this? Well, this helped to keep interest rates low in the U.S. It helped us all to have cheap mortgages in the early 2000s. It was one of the, the uh, contributing factors to the U.S. housing bubble. But it was good for the U.S. consumer because the U.S. consumer doesn't have any savings uh, and likes to borrow a lot of money to buy this stuff from China. So China buying our treasuries helped to keep interest rates low. It helped to keep mortgages, um, mortgage interest rates cheap. And it basically allowed us to have lower interest rates all across the curve, uh, lower credit card interest rates, etc. But where lower interest rates were really good uh, was for Wall Street. Hedge funds love low interest rates uh, because you can borrow at a really low rate, invest it, and, pa and uh, capture capture the difference. So this was very good. This is a good policy for China, which wanted to grow its economy and get closer to being world power. It was very good for Wall Street and all the, the US interests uh, that have money. And basically the US government is run for the benefit of wealthy people, especially Wall Street and bankers. Now the problem with this is it destroyed a lot of jobs. This was very bad for Main Street. It hollowed out the middle, middle class. It sent all our manufacturing jobs to China and also to uh, call it Indonesia, Philippines, all these other uh, Asian countries. Now, this really came home to roost and sort of the folly of it became apparent in 2020 with the COVID crisis when we reached the point where the common man on the street realized, wow, we can no longer make masks. We can't even make our own prescription drugs. A lot of our defense components are made in China. So this was sort of taken to an absurd level. But this was the existing system that's been in place really for the last 20 years. Now, something weird happened in 
uh, the middle of 2014. This is a chart of federal debt, U.S. Treasuries, held by foreign investors. Uh, these foreign investors are mostly uh, central banks and uh, big pension companies, so maybe a European pension company or insurance company, Japanese pension or insurance company. And what happened is in the middle of 2014, for the first time, the, uh, the amount of foreign debt as a percentage, the amount of federal debt held by foreign interests like central banks, pension companies, foreign mutual funds began to decline. Foreigners were holding less U.S. debt. Now, this was exacerbated in 2018 when a very popular trade fell apart. So even though interest rates were still fairly low in the U.S., they were higher than most parts of the world, what you could do as a foreign investor is you could invest, you could buy U.S. treasuries, you could hedge your currency, currency exposure, and you would get a pickup in yield from this. Now, the way this worked was basically, let's say you're a European pension company. You, you, you have some euros. Uh, all of your, your whole fund is denominated in euros. So you, what you do is you just, uh, like anyone else, you exchange it for U.S. dollars. Uh, so you sell your euros, you buy U.S. dollars, and then you use those U.S. dollars to buy U.S. treasuries. Now, this is a nice thing for the U.S. because it's helping to soak up our, 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 our debt and allowing us to, our, the U.S. government, to spend well beyond its means. But basically, this was a way that uh, trade that central banks could do and that big institutional overseas investors could do. So they would sell their local currency, maybe sell their euros, buy U.S. dollars, and then use those dollars to help prop up our debt, to buy U.S. treasuries. And then at the same time, they would enter into a forward agreement or swap to sell those U.S. dollars in, say, a year from now. So let's say they bought a one-year treasury, one-year T-bill, and then they would enter into a simultaneous agreement to sell their dollars, swap them back into euros a year from now. Now, they made a little bit of uh, interest income or yield from the U.S. Treasuries, but they made a lot more from the, uh, from the exchange rate. Or if not a, a lot more, it helped to, to prop up their returns. And so what happened in the third quarter of 2018, as we see in this Bloomberg article, this, uh, this, this FX hedged Treasury trade, where foreign investors were buying our debt hedging the currency exposure so that if the dollar moved a lot against their local currency, they wouldn't lose money. All of a sudden, it turned negative. And so if they wanted to hedge their currency exposure, they would have to be satisfied with much lower yields and in some cases, negative yields. So what this meant is that uh, U.S. debt was no longer being, uh, being bought by uh, foreigners to the same extent. And this really exacerbated the trend that we saw beginning in 20, uh, 2014. So if foreigners are not going to buy U.S. debt, who's going to buy U.S. debt? Well, it has to be domestic interests. It has to be U.S. banks. It has to be uh, private individuals. It has to be U.S. pension funds, etc. But it reached the point where the U.S. was issuing so much debt that the market couldn't sop it, uh, soak it up anymore. And so what happened in the fourth quarter, third, fourth quarter of last, uh, sort of late third quarter of 2019, is we got a big spike up in repo rates. Repo rates back then were normally around 2%. This is basically just how banks finance their holdings of treasuries. It spiked to 10%. Now, what's the problem with a 10% repo rate or short-term interest rate? Well, if repo rates are at 10%, that means the long bond is probably at, uh, call it 12%, the US 30-year debt's at 12%. And mortgages, or the, the, you know, the 10-year note or the 30-year uh, the 30 30 year bond in the US would be at 12%, which means that the annual interest rate on your mortgage would be something like 14 or 15%. Now, obviously, this would destroy the entire uh, US economy. We're built on borrowing. Housing market really contributes to economic wealth. And so you can't have mortgage rates all of a sudden spike to 14%. So what did the Fed do? What they had to do was, and we can see it here, this is a chart of the, the Fed, uh, uh, the, the US Federal Reserve, our central bank balance sheet. These are their assets, and these are mostly treasuries. So starting in the fourth quarter of 2019, you can see they've, they've been drawing down 
their um, asset position, just letting these these uh, securities mature and roll off their books. All of a sudden, because of this repo crisis, they had to start buying treasuries again. This is because the Chinese weren't buying as many treasuries, the Japanese weren't buying as many treasuries, European pensions weren't buying as many treasuries because they could no longer make money or break even on the currency hedge. And so sort of the last buyer of resort, because we're talking about huge budget deficits that need to be financed by government debt, by treasuries, the last buyer, the buyer of last resort is the central bank. Now, how do they get the money to buy these treasuries? You can see that back in the early 2000s, the Fed's balance sheet was around uh, just below a trillion going into the great financial crisis, spiked up above two trillion, and then it never really came down. Uh, they tried to they tried to shrink the balance sheet, uh, but in the process, these huge budget deficits spiked the uh, spiked the repo rates, and so the Fed had to step back in and grow their uh, their balance sheet. Now they were already growing their balance sheet; they were already buying treasuries in an effort to keep interest rates low, and they were printing new money to buy these treasuries. Is the totally crazy thing, and then what happens? coronavirus hits, COVID-19 hits. And so we were already, uh, the US financial system was already showing all these cracks as, as witnessed by the, uh, the repo rate spiking. And so the Fed had to really increase their buying. So they were already buying uh, treasuries to try to keep interest rates low, prevent them from spiking, prevent all of us from having 12% mortgage rates on our, on, our, on our houses. And then COVID hits, and they need to start buying everything. They're buying, uh, they're buying junk bonds, they're buying munis, they're buying more treasuries, they're buying mortgage-backed securities. And so what happens once they really say that they're gonna, they're gonna buy everything, we get a real rebound in the stock market. So we had plumbed the lows of 2200 on the S&P, and as you've noticed the last two months, we've really rallied back to, interestingly enough, 2018 levels. And as I'm gonna suggest later, these 2018 levels are not a coincidence. This is really when things changed and we were no longer able to have foreigners finance our debt. So it's significant that we're, we're sort of back to these levels. And this has been very puzzling for a lot of people, including myself. There's just an article in the Wall Street Journal this morning talking about the economy so bad, why is the stock market rallying? We can see here, uh, 30 million claims in six weeks, jobless claims. All the economic data is just terrible. Obviously, new car sales, uh, unemployment, all, all these things. It's very hard to buy a new car or, uh, or uh, have, a normal, have a normal life when we're still under, under lockdown and the virus is, is returning in waves and possibly mutating as well. So you have this disconnect between the stock market and the real economy. There's an interesting tweet here from Joe uh, Weisenthal, uh, that the, the only fast growing sector of the labor market is uh, employment at central banks. Central banks hired uh, 100 new people over whatever this period was. Maybe it's, a, I think it's a, a monthly period. Obviously, there's been some hiring in computers, uh, couriers and messengers. US Postal Service hired 500 new people. Uh, this is a pretty funny joke that uh, the, the fastest growing sector right now are the central uh, central bankers. So I thought I would, uh, by way of comparison, look at some other countries that have very bad uh, economies and then take a look and see how that was reflected in their stock market. So we have Venezuela here. This is a, uh, I think this is a fairly recent news story about uh, food, cr food riots and uh, protesters getting shot by the, uh, by the police. Uh, here we can see a, a chart of U.S. of I'm sorry Venezuelan GDP, so sort of their economic output, and it's really been falling since 2015. So if you have food riots, if you have uh, falling GDP, what would you expect a stock market to do? Well, if we look at the Caracas Stock Exchange Stock Market Index, which is the main index for Venezuela, Venezuela does have a stock market. Uh, it did fairly well on Friday. It was up uh, a little more than 3%. But when we start looking at the year-to-date returns, our eyes sort of pop out. Uh, in 2020, the stock market in Venezuela has been up 
262, almost 263 percent. Absolutely unbelievable. I think the NASDAQ is maybe up 1% for the year. It's our best performing stock index. And we can see that the 12-month return, the one-year return for the Venezuelan stock market is 1,800%. So here's a great example of a very bad economy with a very strong stock market. Now, this is these, these numbers are denominated in Venezuelan boulevards. And the problem with the boulevard is it has been plummeting in value. This is a chart of the exchange rate, the US dollar versus the boulevard. We can see that coming into 2020, the exchange rate was uh, $1, $1 bought about 46,000 uh, Venezuelan boulevards, and it's now up to 172,000. So we're talking about very, very, uh, a very weak currency and very high inflation rates as well. And so this leads to the situation where people are just throwing their money on the street. They're making uh, handbags out of the money. They, uh, they, can, they can do better making handbags out of it and selling it than actually spending the money because it's being, it's being devalued so quickly over time. And this has the perverse effect of driving up the stock market in Venezuelan boulevard terms. So the stock market is doing very well in Venezuela as measured in bolivars, but in US dollars, it is crashing. So the moral of this is you can always make a stock market go up in its native currency, in its local currency. But it doesn't mean that the purchasing power has gone up. And this is often what happens in bad economies um, where you have a lot of money printing and inflation is out of control. Stocks do really well. Uh, their nominal returns are very well. But if you adjusted this for real returns in terms of purchasing power, if you had put your money in the Venezuelan stock market, uh, your wealth would not have gone up 17, 18x. In fact, your wealth would have gone down because as the stocks were going up, the value of the currency that was denominated in was going down, as we can see here, as the dollar gained strength. And so the money becomes more and more worthless even as the stocks go up. Something similar has happened in Zimbabwe. Zimbabwe up 117% this year, but no one would think the, uh, I don't know what the currency is. Oh, it's the uh, RTGS. Uh, no one would think that the Zimbabwe, uh, the Zimbabwe currency or stock market is a good place to store uh, wealth. This is a country that doesn't really respect private property. There's a lot of corruption and they're printing a lot of money. So let's rewind now. Our, our basic thesis has been that the, uh, the US government has been issuing more and more debt. It's been so much that uh, foreign markets haven't been able to soak it up. Even domestic, the domestic market in the US hasn't been able to soak it up. And so the Fed has had to print money because China, Japan, Russia are no longer buying as many of our treasuries. So let's take a quick look. What has China been buying? They haven't been buying, they still own a lot of our treasuries, but they've been sort of drawing down their position uh, over the last five, seven years. At the same time, they've been massively increasing their gold reserves. They've been, they've been, buying, uh, they've been buying a ton of gold and you can see sort of the stair-step function here. And it's really moved up since call it 2015 when they really start scaling back in US treasuries and they've been putting their money in gold as well. Russia's been doing the same thing. Under Putin, they've massively increased uh, their gold holdings. And this is why it's very important to not, uh, to not have a simplistic view of the world and to not say China and Russia are evil and stupid. They're actually very smart. Um, they're much better run than we are in some respects, not, certainly not in all respects. But here's a great example of these governments uh, buying gold. Gold sort of bottomed in the early, early 2000s, late 90s. They've been buying gold and um, using it as a store of value as they realized that uh, the US dollar is being devalued and we're issuing more and more debt. Now, what's the US done with its gold reserves? Well, it's actually been selling off its gold reserves since 2000. It's been fairly stable over the last few years, um, but definitely down from 2000 levels. Germany has been constantly since 2000 selling off their gold reserves. Basically, uh, Germany, the US and the UK have been selling their gold. Uh, one way to look at it is we've been selling our gold to uh, Russia and China because Russia and China have been net buyers. They've been, uh, these European countries and the US and the UK have been net sellers. So 
United Kingdom gold reserves really, they sold most of theirs at the lows in the early 2000s. This is one of the great crimes of Tony Blair. He sold 60% of the UK gold reserves at $275 an ounce. Whatever you think of his other politics, this is just absolutely, uh, absolutely appalling. And the UK has definitely suffered from it. Uh, so he was selling gold at $275 an ounce. Spot gold prices now are 1700. He would have had almost venture capital returns if he had just held on to that gold, which had obviously been in the English coffers, in the UK coffers, for many hundreds, if not uh, a, th a thousand years. Now, this the reason I mentioned gold is that I think it's important to look at stock markets in terms of their real purchasing power. And so if you're invested in the, the Venezuelan stock market, you're making very high returns, but your purchasing power is going down. And what this means is that you can buy fewer and fewer uh, real goods and services with your wealth from the stock market. And this is what's been happening in the S&P as well, really since 2000. So this is the S&P 500, the largest cap stocks in the US, a fairly diversified basket, though it's heavily skewed toward tech, obviously with the, uh, the FANG stocks now. But we can see that this stock market, our, the US stock market, the main index, peaked in uh, 2000 and has been going down ever since then. And if we scroll in, we can see that we did have a bit of a rebound. Uh, the stock market in gold terms peaked in the fourth quarter, uh, I'm sorry, in the third quarter of 2018. And it's interesting, I don't think it's a coincidence that this happened at the same time that we were no longer able to finance our big budget deficits by selling the uh, garbage paper, the treasuries, to uh, foreign investors. Foreign investors got very smart. They started buying gold uh, instead. And so the stock market in purchasing power terms, in terms of real wealth, the ability to buy things, for example, exchange your, your SPY fund or your stocks for gold and other real world things, peaked in the fourth quarter of 2018. We've been sort of in a bear market since then and in a much larger bear market since uh, this, if we adjusted this, it would probably go back to the 19, 1970s uh, when we were last trading at these levels, the S&P 500 expressed in gold. And for all the big tech revolution, the FANG stocks, the Amazons and Apples and Googles and Facebooks of the world, the QQQ, which is really heavily skewed to their, toward those companies, also peaked in, uh, in 2000 and has never, uh, never really recovered from that. So this is the QQQ the NASDAQ 100 expressed in gold. And we can see that the NASDAQ 100 expressed in gold also peaked at the same time as the S&P in the fourth quarter of 2018, when it no longer became possible to finance US federal uh, government debt externally. So we have this very strange situation where we've had a rally. And to me, it smells a lot like, obviously, the United States is not a developing country. It's not a third world country yet with food riots. But I think we're seeing something very similar here where stocks are rallying, but they're not rallying in real terms. They've actually been going down in real terms. We've seen a little bit of a bounce in the, in the last two months, but we're still very, very far below uh, previous, previous peaks as adjusted, uh, as adjusted by gold. And so what I would suggest is that it's quite uh, it would be actually quite easy to get to Dow 100,000. That's just going up 3x. We can see that stock markets can go up. They can go up 200%. They can go up 1,800%. When you're printing money, when you have a Fed printing money and buying, um, buying treasuries, buying junk bonds, and maybe even buying stocks, as the Bank of Japan is doing, the Fed could definitely move in that direction. Janet Yellen has said that she thought it might be a good option to have going forward. Under these conditions, you can definitely see Dow 100,000. But when you adjust Dow 100,000 for the gold price or for its real purchasing power, I would expect it to be much lower. So you can have very high nominal returns, but real returns, real returns after inflation. And as a measurement of your purchasing power, it doesn't mean, if we do see Dow 100,000, we start to see new highs in the S&P 500 or the NASDAQ. I think this is what's happening, where you're seeing a, a real devaluation of the US dollar and real estate prices, stock prices, gold prices, Bitcoin prices, everything that's scarce is being pushed up by this devaluation of the dollar. And so when you have Dow 100,000, 
uh, there's a good chance that you're going to have Big Macs at twenty dollars or fifty dollars. Uh, these these higher prices will eventually filter in to the real economy. For the last 10 years, there's been a lot of central bank money printing. It's really just gone into equities. It's gone into bonds. Basically, the Federal Reserve now controls the whole bond market. It's buying everything from treasuries, the safest debt, all the way to, uh, to junk bonds. And as a result, if anyone gets in trouble, they know they can always go to the Fed. And so uh, quantitative easing, money printing has really helped to pump up asset prices. But we're entering a later stage now where there's a huge amount of wealth inequality because of these higher asset prices. And so we're going to be forced to uh, continue to mail checks to people as we started to do during the COVID crisis, also known as UBI, Universal Basic Income, where the government starts sending monthly checks to people. And so we'll have this sort of twin policy of the government printing money, using it to buy stocks and bonds to prop up asset prices, and also using it to uh, send checks uh, to people to offset the uh, loss of jobs and also the higher prices that are ultimately going to filter through. And once you start doing UBI, this is definitely what pushes, pushes up inflation. So we could have a very strange situation where asset prices continue to go up. We do see Dow 100,000, but at the same time, we see much higher prices in the real economy. And we're in this very bad uh, sort of vicious circle where the U.S. government has to print more and more debt uh, because we're obviously never going to be able to collect enough taxes to pay for uh, to fit, pay for all the federal spending. And it's almost sort of ridiculous when you're sending free checks to people. Uh, do you tax those? Uh, if you tax them, you're basically just clawing back a little bit of the money that you just uh, printed. And if you don't tax them, either way, this federal tax revenue number really suffers. It will be uh, propped up to some extent by higher stock prices. If we see Dow 100,000, there can be a lot of people paying stock option gains and, and uh, uh, other forms of capital gains. It's that that will help to pump this up, but it does not mean that real wealth will be increasing. And as a result, we will see the US dollar continue to lose its purchasing power. It's lost something like 90% of its purchasing power since 19, uh, call it 1950 or so. Um, but this is what always happens with fiat currencies. And rather than telling people that they're not going to get their social security payments or telling the military that they there's no money to, buy, to build new ships to, uh, to uh, possibly use in a war against China, uh, which has been, of course, accumulating gold and, and exiting our treasuries, what the Fed will do, the Fed will just keep printing money. And I think that's what we've been seeing with higher nominal stock prices since the beginning of the uh, crisis. But what's interesting is that uh, if you, if you uh, let's see, if we go back and look at the S&P, since uh, we're basically back to uh, call it third quarter of 2018 levels on the S&P 500, if we go back and look at the Fed's balance sheet, it was back in the fourth quarter of 2018, it was at about four, um, $4.2 trillion. So we basically added more than $2 trillion of new money printing and assets to the Fed's balance sheet to keep us in the same place, to keep us where we were in February, in uh, September of 2018. And so this is the problem with this system. You need to print more and more money in order to uh, get higher asset prices because there's the underlying economy is dysfunctional. It's been taken over too much by the central bank. And when you have the central bank bailing out junk bond companies that have junk bonds, all of a sudden the pricing of risk goes out the window and everyone begins to play the game where I'm just going to sell whatever junk I have to the Federal Reserve. This is not good for productivity. This is not good for, uh, for human civilization. And so in order to levitate prices, to get, to get new highs on the S&P 500, to get Dow 100,000, you can just imagine what sort of expansion of the Fed balance sheet it's going to take. If it's taken $2 trillion just to claw back from uh, the, the, uh, the March 2020 lows, to claw back to the, the level of the third quarter 2018, you can imagine how much this balance sheet is going to have to grow from $6 trillion to $10 trillion to $20 trillion to $30 trillion, et cetera. And that process is going to be very good 
for a couple asset classes. It's going to be good for gold, which has been really waking up for the last uh, year and a half, and particularly the last couple months. It'll be good for gold stocks. Uh, GDX is one of my favorite uh, ETFs here. Stocks like uh, Barrick Gold, Newmont Mining, the big gold stocks. They should do well, at least at the beginning of this, uh, until their expenses uh, are also driven up, uh, their mining costs, their labor costs. If we get a lot of inflation, that'll begin to hurt the miners. And so gold is, uh, physical gold uh, is, is a good way to deal with that, as well as Bitcoin. And I would, I would suggest that one reason Bitcoin has been rising so much over the last few months is that it's beginning uh, to really price in this, the, the Fed printing presses and the enormous amount of stimulus that is going to be needed to, uh, to keep stock prices level and possibly, uh, especially if we're looking at an election year here in the U.S., to, to, to push prices uh, much higher. And we know that Trump has valued, has always said that the stock market is his scorecard. So I wouldn't be surprised if the, uh, the executive branch and the uh, legislative branch and the, the, the central bank, the Fed, throw everything they can at equities to push them higher. Now, something could break in the meantime. So this is not a, a, not a guarantee. But if we begin to see gold and Bitcoin really take off, I would suggest that that's how we will know that this is not a uh, not a really healthy rally. And so, in uh, in real terms, we will see uh, we will see the S and P gold ratio continue to hit new lows. If gold rallies a lot, the denominator becomes really much bigger. If I were to uh, show you this in Bitcoin terms, I'd have to use a logarithmic chart uh, simply because Bitcoin has outperformed uh, equities by so much over the last 10 years. So the good news is we do have some metrics now that can help us to keep an eye on these guys. When you see gold spiking and continuing to go up month after month, year after year, Bitcoin as well, we know that the game is being played is very similar to the game that was, that's being played in Venezuela and Zimbabwe. The US has the world reserve currency, so we can do this for a while. It's not quite as, uh, not quite as precarious as some of these developing, uh, developing markets. But it's definitely bad for purchasing power. And you need to think about uh, growing your wealth in real terms. If you're just growing it in nominal terms, if you're a Zimbabwean or, or Venezuelan stock market investor, your wealth is actually being confiscated and going down over time. And I expect to see higher taxes in the US as well, which will further contribute. It's gonna be a very difficult uh, tide to swim against this, this uh, money printing and shrinking of, uh, of personal wealth. But I think the two places you can really hide out in are gold and Bitcoin. And because of this, because of these dynamics, these, these two asset classes, gold and uh, I would say scarce real estate and Bitcoin, can, uh, will continue to do very, very well for the coming decade. The Fed's going to need to continue to print. There's no one left to buy our debt. Uh, China's certainly not going to go back to buying our treasuries. Uh, they'll probably draw down their position over time, let it roll off the books. Same with Russia. And this has profound geopolitical consequences as well. As we uh, debase our currency, uh, the, uh, the purchasing power of Chinese gold and Russian gold will continue, uh, will continue to go up. So that's definitely uh, something to keep an eye on. And uh, I think that's one way that we could definitely see Dow 100,000. It would be a little bit of a Pyrrhic victory if we get there because of all this money printing. Hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, be sure to hit that subscribe and like button. Let me know your questions and comments in the comment section below. And I look forward to seeing you in the next video. Thanks a lot for watching.